Thank you for being with us. We are going to be uh, moving to our sixth theme of Future Church. Uh, we're going to be talking about being a community of holiness um, in a culture of moral relativism. Uh, this is going to be a more hefty uh, talk, so be gracious with me, but more importantly, um, let's have our hearts open because this is, I think is a really, really important conversation, not only for our church, um, but specifically in the cultural climate that we live in. And so uh, just, just to kind of go over some review, we've talked about how we are called to be a community of tight-knit loving relationships and a culture of individualism and isolation. Our second week, we talked about how we are to be a community of rest in a culture of exhaustion. We're to be a community of contribution in a culture of careerism. We talked about how we're going to be a community of peace in a culture of fear. We talked about how we're a community of orthodoxy, orthodoxy in a culture of ideological idolatry. And this week we're talking about holiness. Um, but the next two weeks we're going to be talking about being a community of hospitality in a culture of polarization. And lastly, we're going to talk about being a community of justice in a cultural culture of brokenness. And um, these have been really, really important messages. If you missed any of them, please go back and check them out. Uh, this one in particular is one that probably is the most sensitive. Um, and so I just want to kind of set the table saying a couple of things. One, uh, we're doing this uh, in tandem with other churches, Park Hill Church and Neighbors Church and Bridgetown and Reality San Francisco. And um, pastorally, as we've been talking uh, this has been the one that we, we know in this short span that we have in the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to be touching on things that are deserving of much longer personal and intimate conversations. Um, but if you go back a couple weeks, we talked about how we're a culture of orthodoxy, orthodoxy, that we would be able to just lean into scripture and what it says. And if you didn't get to listen to that one, um, that you kind of have to listen to that one before we do this one, um, because that kind of sets the framework of what sets our worldview in reality. Um, and so before we start talking about what it means to be a culture of holiness, uh, I want to just talk about the culture that we, we live in, because it's incredibly interesting. Uh, literally, the world has never seen the cultural climate that we're in today. Uh, and that really started coming about in the last 50 years um, with this fast and rapid swing towards uh, what philosophers and sociologists call postmodernism. And one of the things, and postmodernism sometimes gets a bad rap, it's not all bad, uh, but it is kind of this uh, reaction towards uh, authority and a reaction towards the abuse of truth and leadership. And one of the kind of the hallmarks of postmodernism is this, this idea that all truth is relative. There are no absolutes, that all authority um, is relative. And so that obviously plays into our understanding of morality and ethics. What is right and wrong? And that becomes a really uh, confusing place. Uh, when, as followers of Jesus, we believe that there are moral absolutes. There is right and wrong. It's not an excuse uh, to ostracize people, to push people out, to beat people up. But as followers of Jesus, we are in the West becoming the minority in our thought pattern of, and belief that reality points to there is good and bad, there's right and wrong, and we know where to find the source of that. You see, every culture has to answer these four questions. How do we know right from wrong? Who gets to decide what is right and wrong? Why does this group or this person carry moral authority and another doesn't? And by what standards is right and wrong defined? And um, those are really important questions. And our culture has been challenging those questions against, like I said, an idea of absolute truth or any sort of hierarchy or authoritarian figure, including God and including the Bible. Matter of fact, there's a recent um, article in the Washington Post by Kate Cohen 
entitled, if they're going to keep passing religious laws, we're going to need exemptions. Uh, she not being religious, not having faith in Jesus and being a vocal atheist is kind of a railing against this idea of if religious people get to have exemptions <coughs> from certain things, then as a non-religious person, we want exemptions um, from religious laws. And she writes this, we act as if religious people are the only ones who follow a moral compass and the rest of us just wander around like sheep in search of avocado toast. But you don't need to believe in God or a particular religious tenet to have a strong sense of right and wrong. And uh, that brings up some really interesting questions. Is that true? Do you not have to believe in a God or certain sacred tenets in order to have a sense of right and wrong? And here's what's and here's what it boils down to. We are the first culture in history of the world without some sort of sacred order. And by sacred order, some sense of there is a final authority. Um, there is a transcendent God. There is um, even, a there is this sense of authority. All of that's kind of gone. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, then where do we who gets to decide what's right and wrong? And the answer for moral relativists, which most of our culture is at this point, even within the church, is self. I get to decide what is right and wrong. As in, and oftentimes we throw in this caveat, as long as I'm not hurting someone. But who are you to tell me what's right and wrong? Um, if I'm the one, I'm the ultimate authority and the ultimate judge of who gets to decide these things. And if you are trying to tell me or force your sense of right and wrong on me, then all of a sudden that's wrong, which is kind of an interesting idea in and of itself. David Wells in his book, No Place for Truth, uh, talks about how this plays into theology and our understanding of God. He says, theology becomes therapy when the Bible interest and the biblical interest in righteousness is replaced by a search for happiness holiness by wholeness truth by feeling ethics by feeling good about oneself the world shrinks to the range of personal circumstances the community of faith shrinks to a circle of personal friends the past recedes the church recedes the world recedes and all that remains is the self um, John Mark Comer just recently came out with a book called Live No Lies. Um, and uh, in just short commercial, uh, one of the most important books I think I've ever read, uh, specifically around this topic, um, would encourage you just to, to pick up that book or the audio book. And in, in that book, he writes this, Self is the new God, the new spiritual authority, the new morality. But this puts a crushing weight on the self. One it was never designed to bear. It must discover itself, become itself, stay true to itself, justify itself, make itself happy, perform and defend its fragile identity. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. It's been the past 50 years, even though it happened much earlier in the Enlightenment, but really since the 60s, there has been this cultural swing towards this idea of you can't tell me what's right and wrong. I get to decide what's right and wrong. I think it really begs a really, really important question. And the question is this, is it working? If, if it's true that any sort of authority or leadership or truth is ultimately oppressive and forcing us into something that's not our true selves, and all of a sudden authority has been replaced by authenticity, is it working? How is this turning out? Um, how does this how is this working when it comes to right and wrong, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to all of these different things? And I and I think I, as a pastor, I just wanted to just point to some statistics. And again, these aren't things I'm making up. These are just things that um, people who are Christians, non-Christians, right and left, these are things that have been documented. Um, along these lines, is this idea of self being the ultimate moral authority is it working? Number one, these are just some facts. Divorce is increasing, and it is a traumatic event for children of all ages, and we're learning it's directly tied to the rising number of people who are struggling to develop intimate 
healthy relationships in adulthood. Psychologists argue that the drop in those who identify as having secure attachment is wreaking havoc in our society. Number two, divorce, while cited as an example of liberation from the patriarchy, has been shown to disproportionately benefit men. Number three, those who cohabitate before marriage are less likely to marry, are more likely to get a divorce if they do, and often develop long-term trust issues. Number four, research on oxytocin and vas vasopressin, the two chemicals released by our body during sex that brings our attachment systems online and cause us to bond to another person, it seems that the more sexual partners you have, the less capacity your body has for intimacy. Number five, the much documented but little talked about data on the effects of abortion on women's mental and physical health, causing some to hypothesize the left will eventually change its now hardline view because of the damage. Number six, 25% of children spend a portion of their childhood without a father in the home. Overwhelming evidence indicates that this experience is damaging to both boys and girls. Number seven, sex reassignment surgery and hormone therapy for those who are identifying as transgender do not benefit their emotional health, which is the main rationale behind them. Number eight, porn is becoming increasingly violent, misogynistic, and cruel, and is now a multi-billion dollar industry intentionally targeting children. Number nine, while the Me Too a movement was dominating headlines, at the same time, the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy, a story about male sexual domination, was becoming the highest selling book series of the decade and one of the highest grossing film franchises of all time. Lastly, sexual abuse and sexual assault are getting worse, not better. Statistically, one out of every four women will experience sexual violence at some point in their lives. Now take a deep breath. I'm not here to depress you. Uh, but the point is, uh, the reason something shifted in the 50s, if you look back to our history, this is the first time there began to be federal laws passed with things like um, the pill, uh, things for abortion, things that all of a sudden started to change the climax, the climate of sexuality, of family, of these things. Um, and all of them were done in the name of freedom. All of them were done with this, this, this deep hearted belief of this will be better for us. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question objectively, is it providing the evidence that it promised it would 50 years ago, 20 years ago, and where are we left with? And you see, this is what's so interesting. At the same time, our culture is becoming more moral, specifically in lines of human rights and um, social activism and things that, a lot of, that are actually very Christian in nature. And at the very same time, we're becoming increasingly immoral. And the reason behind all of that is moral relativism. And now here's what's here's what's so fascinating to me. We we think that this is um, because of the Enlightenment, because of postmodern philosophers and the French Revolution, all of these things. But if you actually go backwards to the very beginning, this is the deep rooted foundation of every single sin. This is what was whispered into the ear of Eve. Listen to this in Genesis three one through five. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did not say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And it doesn't take a theologian or scholar just to hear what's happening at the very inception of sin. The serpent, who we find out later is the embodiment of Satan, comes up and he sows doubt into the character of God as being good and loving. And he challenges Eve don't you think you should decide what's right and wrong? 
Don't you think? I mean, God's withholding from you. Ignatius of Loyola actually talks about, he defines sin as a refusal to believe that God only wants our truest happiness for us. And so you here you have in this garden, this, this scene that is playing itself out in 2021. In this idea of not on an individual level, but now at a cultural level, is do you really think God is the source of knowledge of good and evil? Don't you think you should be the one who decides what is good and evil? You really think he wants what's best for you? You see, we have a culture who, in the name of things like liberation and freedom from oppression, are actually shifting any sense of moral authority off of a transcendent being for us, that's Jesus Christ, and onto the self. But what we see again and again is when that happens, so does destruction. It doesn't produce the freedom it promises. It didn't produce freedom for Adam and Eve. But here's what I would love for us to pay attention to, is when Adam and Eve these pictures of humanity gave into that temptation to define good and evil for themselves. God shows up not with uh, weaponry, not with shame, but meets them in their shame and ends up clothing them because of, because of the sacrifice of an innocent animal. But he also curses the serpent. And in that curse, he says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So there's this seed of the woman, the seed of serpent, that there is now a cosmic war going on of who gets to define what is good and evil. And in this picture, this serpent says, your, your head will be crushed, but you will strike his heel. That somehow in this mutual dying, there will be a switch of who's victorious. And this is kind of the, the very first prophecy we have of Jesus. That God is moving towards us in our brokenness. And so if you're here and you're just like, I don't know if I believe all this. I don't know if I can trust the Bible or Jesus or a pastor or a church to tell me what's right and wrong. It seems incredibly intrusive and oppressive. I, I would just like to, to draw you just to suspend judgment for a moment. And I want you just to think about Jesus. Jesus, who is God, who has moved towards us in our sin and in our shame, not in punishment, but in redemption to rescue us from the punishment that sin brings upon ourselves. So oftentimes we think God's going to punish us from our sin. But if you've been around sin, sin punishes us by itself. I mean, as a pastor, I sit with people every single week sobbing because of what sin has done in their marriages, what sin has done in their mental health, what sin has done um, in their jobs, what sin has done in their own soul. I mean, sin is an absolute tyrant. And so for us to think that God is coming as some sort of tyrannical dictator robbing us of joy and fun, just what has life apart from the way of God, what has that produced in you? And this is speaking from someone, just I've seen it up close in my own life and other people's lives. And so when we move towards the life of Jesus, we have to ask ourselves this question, what's our response to the, to the serpent crusher, to the one who comes redeemed us from this lie? And the answer, um, which shouldn't shock you based on the title I gave you, is holiness is that God has made us holy. He's literally made us righteous. He's given us that as a gift. At the same time, he calls us into that lifestyle. He's calling us to be a community of holy people set apart for him. It's what holy means. It's like you, you use this for special purposes. And this is what, what is the beautiful invitation that the gospel gives is that you don't have to live underneath the cultural currents around you, but you, just, you get to live differently. Listen to what um, Peter writes in his letter to the church that he's pastoring. This is 1 Peter 13. He says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, 
Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. I love that. Just think clearly. Jesus is coming back. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Our response to the holiness Christ gives us by the cross is to live out our holiness. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners or as exiles here in reverent fear. I just love that picture. This isn't our home. And why this can get frustrating is when we think this is all that we have, but we live in a much larger narrative than that. We have an eternal inheritance sealed by the blood of Jesus. We're welcome into this new family. Verse 18, for you know that it was not the perishable things, much silver or gold that you were redeemed with, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. I love it. The empty way of life. Verse 19, I want you to hear this. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see, when we realize the cost, it helps us regain trust. I just want to say that again. When we realize what it cost God to make us holy, it changes how we want to live. The Apostle Paul brings up the same theme in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, when he's talking to a church that is incredibly promiscuous and doing all sorts of sexual sins. He says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You were bought with a price. Your bodies are matter. What we do with them matter. Why? Well, because we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and when we realize that, we now are called to live out in a holy way. Um, Jackie Hill Perry, who just came out with another book I'd highly recommend called Holier Than Thou, says, I believe it's necessary to first establish what holy thing must happen in us before we even are able to be holy ourselves. The agent of this work is the Holy Spirit. To neglect him in any discussion regarding sanctification is to venture off into a land scripture hasn't led you to, and a land that the scripture beckons you to flee from. Without the Holy Spirit, any hope of being holy like God is futile. So let me give us a warning before I give us our three points. And here's a warning. If we think about holiness, as an act of the will, as something that comes from our own willpower, strength, decision even, um, we run the very high risk of becoming self-righteous. We will use our perceived holiness as a way to belittle others, whether it's an individual or a subculture or an entire culture we can begin to start using our holiness as something that we have generated in ourselves. And what I love from the poet is this isn't, this isn't something that just comes because we've decided to, because we're better, we're, we think more clearly. This, becomes, this comes to us because of a gift. And it comes through us because of the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk about three areas in our lives that the scripture calls us to be holy in. God calls us to be holy in our minds, holy in our bodies, and holy with our hearts. And again, understanding is being set apart uh, for the purpose of beauty, truth, redemption, and ultimately to honor God. So let's start with our minds. Romans 12, 1 through 2, which we've quoted a couple times through the series, is Paul pleading with the church in Rome? And he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, right, the summary of the first 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. 
You see, our minds are called to be holy. And I, I'm convinced there has never been a time in all of history that our minds are more susceptible to unholy things. Again, in John Mark's new book, he has this really brilliant excerpt and he says this, everything we allow into our minds has an effect on our souls for good and for evil. If you don't believe me, go do a little research on neurobiology, specifically how what we see affects our mirror neurons and how thoughts enter the mind, creating neural pathways in our brains, which create DNA proteins in our nervous systems, which are then disseminated through our bodies and become a part of us. And some argue are in turn passed to our children in their genetic code. Synopsis, what we give our attention to will shape the persons we become. What we think about we become. Think about the simple math of it. The average American adult watches TV or videos online for about five to six hours a day. The average millennial is on her, um, on her phone up to four hours a day. That adds, to, adds up to about a decade of your life. Barna's recent research on millennials found they spend almost 2,800 hours a year consuming digital content. And of that, only 153 hours of that is Christian based. The rest is an inter internet cornucopia of YouTube, Instagram, Netflix, Apple, and others. My point is this, many of us spend hours every day filling our minds with lies, cutting off our minds from God's spirit and truth, and only a few minutes each morning, if that, filling our minds with truth and resting the spirit or presence of our Father. The poet Mary Oliver says it like this, attention is the beginning of devotion. God is calling us to have holy minds. Do not think for a second you are not being formed by what you are letting in through your eyes and ears and ultimately your mind. That will affect your body, which is number two. We are called to have holy bodies. I'm going to go back to that passage in 1 Corinthians 6 in just these poignant words. Your body is not your own. It has been bought with a price. This is, if you read a few verses up, this is what Paul is saying to this church who is incredibly promiscuous in their sexuality, probably very similar to what our culture is doing right now. And he quotes this, this normal cultural saying, says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. Notice that's in quotes. It's a cultural saying at the time. And then he says, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Meaning it's just, it's just a body, right? Just a craving, just giving it what it wants. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said that two shall become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Um, I know being holy with our body includes what we eat. It includes us being a good steward of the physical body. For the sake of this text and for the time we have, um, I, I want to just kind of hone in on one specific area that requires our holiness in our body, and that's sexuality. It is, and the reason we want to talk about it is not only is it pertinent to the text, but it is also so prevalent in our culture, specifically with this moral, um, kind of this, this progressive postmodern moral relativism of just like, it's my body, I can do what I want. And this is just saying it's, it's not true. Your body was purchased with the blood of Christ and it is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what you do with your body matters. You think about the secular narrative about the body, meaning it's, it's I'm not my body. I can do whatever I want, sleep with whoever I want, do anything what I want with it. 
what a low view of the body that is. And you just, we get to rest in the reality that the scriptures point to an incredibly high view of the body, which plays into our understanding of sexuality, which plays into our understanding of the sanctity of life. Because these bodies, no matter what age, no matter what's been done to them or what they've been used for, are matter to the heart of God. This, this passage tells us four things. More than before that we're going to focus on. Number one, the body is not meant for sexual immorality before the Lord. Number two, Jesus came back from the dead in a body, and we will too. Number three, our bodies are united with Jesus. In the realm of the Spirit, we are one with Jesus, and He is one with us. But what we do with our bodies, He does in the world and members of His body. And number four, sex is not just a biological act. It is a mystical uniting of two souls. This is a radical different vision of the body and sexuality than what's being given to us by our culture. Nancy Piercy in her book, Love Thy Body, says this, What Christians do with their sexuality is one of the most important testimonies they give to the surrounding world. And the reason for that is it's the context where the gospel can be played out so beautifully. Because we live in a world that packages sex, saying it is for your pleasure and your enjoyment. When God designed sex, it was an avenue for you to actually, in the safety of a covenant relationship, to serve selflessly for the sake of long-term covenant renewal in order to produce human flourishing. And we live in a world that says it's about you, which means our bodies and sex become transactional, which is the opposite of the gospel. The gospel is not transactional, it's love. It's given to us, regardless of where we were when we received it, or even if we will receive it, it's love given towards us. And that's the thing that we need to hold to as we hold these two narratives in tension, is recognizing that which one tells a more true, more beautiful, better story? Which kind of adds this question, well, what do, what do we, what does that look like in community? Let me just give you, there's more, but let me just give you five Five ideas for how a countercultural communal vision of holiness and sexuality can play out. Number one, men and women refraining from sex outside of the biblical covenant of marriage. It's trusting that God says it is within that context that it produces uh, flourishing. Number two, men and women seeking a marriage partner not on the basis of looks and wealth, but on character. Number three, the unmarried whether divorced, widowed, or never married, uh, being incorporated as extended family members, having close friendships with both sexes and nurturing relationships with children. We need to have a radical revision of, of singles being able to flourish within the community and body of God. If you're watching this and you're single and you've ever felt on the outside because when you get those questions of like, when are you going to get married? And you're wrestling, you need to have a place that's they're welcoming that. We have people within our community who have same-sex attraction and have chosen to live a life of, um, of devoting in their devotion to Jesus Christ, not to act upon their, uh, upon their sexuality. That's a massive, massive statement of devotion, one that requires a tremendous amount of honor and sensitivity. And if as a church we don't provide space to welcome in singles for whatever reason, um, then they will continue to feel on the outside rather than on the inside. Which leads to the fourth thing. People with same-sex attraction are valued members and are given care and support as they live out lives of committed chastity. And fifthly, people struggling with issues of sex and gender are welcomed and listened to with humility and patience and love. Um, these are incredibly complex and often painful um, things that have been wrestled through in private and have felt unsafe to process these things in community. What does that look like as a follower of Jesus when these things are going on inside of me? And the church has to become the safest place for people who are 
who for a long time maybe have felt on the outside. We need to model ourselves like Jesus to create space at our table for people to come wherever we are and not to dismiss the sexual ethic of Jesus, but to hold to it. And at the same time, for every single one of us, whether you are whether you are someone struggling with pornography, someone who is wrestling through issues of gender, that there is place within the church to come and say, oh, I, I can find Jesus here. Um, and that needs to be our vision and our goal. And the last thing I just want to encourage us is not only do we need to have holy minds, not only do we need to have holy bodies, but we are called to have holy hearts. Psalm 26, 2, the psalmist says, Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart. Look inside. And Proverbs says, Above all else, guard your hearts, for everything you do flows from it. Which is actually makes a lot of sense that in Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are the pure in heart. For what? Listen to this promise. They will see God. When we have a pure mind, pure bodies, and I, and I would say even most importantly, those things flow out of having a pure heart, a holy set apart heart for God. We will see God. And when we see God clearly, it infuses holiness within us. Again, Jackie Hill Perry says, beholding God's glory in God's word and believing all that it shows you transforms you into that same image. And I want to just, before we give you the practice for this week, I know I probably said a dozen sentences that feel emotionally charged, and and maybe I said them wrong. Uh, Feel free to reach out. I'd love to, uh, like I said, continue for this to be a safe place to process through this. Uh, But my hope is this, is that when we see Jesus, as defined by the New Testament authors, as defined by Scripture. It's His holiness that draws us into wanting to live holy lives. It's His beauty and His majesty that makes us run away from anything else the world says is beautiful, but it's a counterfeit. And it calls us into a life not to rob us of joy, but to fulfill that joy. And at the same time, the things that we're talking about today, I know have the the ability to heap on a lot of shame and guilt. Please hear me. God shows up in the very beginning of the Bible as humanity has lived out their vision of defining for their own self what's right and wrong. And he shows up with a prophetic promise of redemption and a sacrifice that would cover them in their shame. This is what Jesus is still doing today through the gospel. And so, welcome conviction and change the Holy Spirit. I pray that the Holy Spirit is convicting me and everyone in our community right now. If we are not living holy, we should live holy. But that cannot come out of a motivation of guilt or shame, but because we have seen God clearly in His holiness. Which leads to our practice this week. We're going to give you two that will help us see God more clearly in His holiness. Number one is fasting. Right when you think this sermon couldn't get more heavy, you're telling me not to eat food. I know, it's just one of those weeks. Um, And the second one might be even more heavy. It's the practice of confession. Fasting and confession. Nothing promotes holiness. Like those two things in my my personal life. Fasting, let's talk about this for a second. Uh, There's four reasons why we fast. Number one, we starve the flesh and we feed the spirit. Uh, Number two, we feel our weakness and utter need upon God. Number three, fasting mysteriously intensifies our prayers. Um, Scott McKnight calls it body talk or groaning beyond words. It's actually praying with our body. It's really a beautiful term. And lastly, it helps us to stand in solidarity with the poor, people who don't have an option to eat. So here's what I'd like to challenge you with. Um, hopefully with your open table if you're connected with one or maybe a group of friends, but to do this in community, choose a day of the week 
um, and fast from sunup to sundown. And only drink water. And um, fasting is specifically biblically is with food. I know we talk about fasting from social media and fasting from this. Or that's that's called abstinence. Fasting has to do with food. So I'm, I'm, if you can and medically it's appropriate, um, with your community, fast. Choose one day a week. And rather than just doing it because I told you, what would it look like to make this a part of your week? Um, on Thursdays, for me, as I write my sermons, I'm fasting. I'm not eating. I'm, I'm reminding myself that the cravings I have for physical food pale in comparison to my craving I need for Jesus. And the second thing I want to just encourage you guys with is confession. James 5, 6 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Confess your sins not only to Jesus, which is where it begins, but one to another. Um, whether that is and by the way, confession doesn't happen by accident. Um, and if it does, it's one in a million. Confession happens when you have intentionally asked for and cultivated safe space and safe people in your life with things simple like this. Can I be real with you? Can you hold me accountable? Do I have permission to speak candidly? Can we keep this within this circle? And you start creating this space where you just go and rather than just checking in about sports or what's going on or how the kids are doing or how you know who you're interested in it's it's all of those things and pray for me i've, I've really messed up this week um i found myself being increasingly greedy and selfish pray for me i struggled with my with lustful thoughts i gave into pornography pray for me i've been living in fear and not in step with the spirit pray for me um, I'm finding myself coveting other things in my life. Pray for me. I, I, there's idols going on. They're grabbing my worship and grabbing my attention, whatever it is. And But here's the thing you need to know. Vulnerability breeds vulnerability. If you're waiting for someone else to start, they're probably waiting for you. So lean into it. Confess one to another, whether it's with your open table, a couple close friends, in your marriage with your spouse. Make room for that. And in conclusion, although this is a beautiful vision for human flourishing, I believe that living out a holy life set apart for God produces the abundant life. It only comes out of a revelation and a relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't get to become more moral on our own strength. It is a gift of God, reliant on the Holy Spirit. Also, to those seeking and observing who Jesus is, maybe you're not a follower of Jesus yet. And this feels crazy to you. I'm so glad you're listening all the way through. And I'm sure it does. Um, you can't start with the moral vision. You have to start with Jesus. And it's only when Jesus gets your trust that any of this makes sense. But it really does. I look at my own life. And then the, the beauty and the goodness of my life often is connected to a life that I've chosen to live that has been modeled to me by Jesus. Next, this topic is a sensitive one, and we ask that you would approach these topics with others, with yourselves, um, with grace, with patience. And lastly, to live in holiness is not a product of our willpower, but like we said before, it is yielding to the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go pray. I want to encourage you to pray with me that we would let the Holy Spirit lead us into holiness. Um, and all that, and here's what's so amazing about God. God doesn't give you a ledger sheet of every single sin you ever committed and said, fix it. In my life, I've noticed the Holy Spirit will come and say, I'm, there's one thing I would like you to deal with. And it wasn't the one thing that my brother was dealing with, my friend was dealing with, but he was specific about my life. And after that thing began to transform because of His grace, um, a new, the Holy Spirit came again and said, okay, we're going to start working on that now. So how God brings transformation in our life is so gracious if you're willing to trust Him. So let's pray. Let's listen to what the Holy Spirit might want to bring to light. Lord, we, we recognize we live in a culture that wants to create a compelling narrative that just says, you do whatever you want. It's fine. God's fine with it. But Lord, we can't read the Bible and come to that same conclusion. Or we read the scriptures and we see a God who designed us with intent and purpose. 
We see in scriptures the life of Jesus Christ who gave us a model to how to live holy. And Lord, we are just, we confess though, God, when we've lived as our own moral authority, it has only led to devastation and destruction. We need a better compass. We're coming back to you. Lord, I pray for those who've heard this message and it has brought up senses of feeling ostracized or outside or misunderstood. Holy Spirit, I'm just asking for you to cover that. And the Lord, that this would create space for conversations, it would create space for healthy dialogue. And Lord, even in the in our community of Light Church, God, that we would be able to hold the tension of people being in different places, in different times, in different walks. But Lord, that we'd all be moving towards you. And, um, and so Lord, help us become a holy community, not a, not a self-righteous community, but a beautifully set-apart community for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.